Well, uh, good morning. My name is Eduardo Chavez, and I am the director of the Rives program at Miami Dade College. I want to thank Dr. Blanco for inviting me to this presentation. I want to thank uh, Lizel Picard for her assistance on that as well. And I, I want to thank you all for being here. My presentation is going to be a little more technical. We're going to talk a little more about the facts. What, what is it that we are doing as a community, as Miami Dade College, and uh, even as, an in, uh, as individuals, to basically complete the cycle of what we were talking about before. Um, there are some flyers out there about the program. Uh, feel free to take it. And I want to uh, also make the note that Miami-Dade County Public Schools has a similar program. It's called the Savez program. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the program. It's run by Maria Miranda from the downtown office in, in, this, in this game. <clears throat> Today they are having a monitoring visit, so I hope they are doing well from, from the state. So, um, please feel free to ask any questions during the presentation. I may have to leave right away as I finish, so we're going to have a brief session of questions, but if you want to interrupt, I enjoy the classroom setting, so feel free just to raise your hand and we can talk uh, and make this more like a dialogue. Um, that's the name of the presentation, basically summarizing what MDC is doing to, as I mentioned before, to complete the cycle of, uh, of the social issue, like Dr. Blanco was mentioning, of the social remittance. First of all, what do we do when we receive uh, any kind of immigrants, be it the definition of a diaspora, as he mentioned before, or be refugees, asylees, immigrants, even illegal population that we're getting to, to this country. So we're trying to see how we can, what we are doing to help them and then what this population can actually do to help others in need. And not, it, it doesn't necessarily have to apply to people in, in other countries. Um, as uh, it was mentioned before, there's a lot of things that we can do also in our community for a lot of uh, people, uh, populations that are in, in not such a convenient or, or easy way in these uh, convoluted days. Uh, opportunity changes everything. That's basically the motto of Miami-Dade College and it's, it's very uh, obvious. Uh, why we see the college as, as a field of opportunities. We have uh, eight campuses. <coughs> spread all around the, the city. We have the largest Hispanic population, student population uh, in the country. And more than one third of our students are basically non-traditional, as I mentioned before. Many immigrants, many refugees, asylees that stay in the college even after they get the, fir the very first basic education in language uh, training. And we have so many specialized programs that uh, pay attention to these uh, populations. One of those opportunities that uh, the college offers for, for, the, for the influx, let's say for the, for the immigration, the people that are bringing the human capital, the social capital, uh, not necessarily the economic, not necessarily the money, but they are bringing the knowledge. As you saw in the, in the short film before, there was a celebration last year for World Refugee Day. These are all actual students in the program, and as you saw, they bring a lot of knowledge with them. They bring a lot of uh, human capital. Many doctors, many lawyers, many uh, people with uh, background in many different fields that are basically coming to the community. And uh, basically what they need is that first helping hand of getting them to learn the language, getting them to get recertified in their areas of expertise. And that's uh, what I do. I'm, I'm very honored uh, of being the director of that program, the REVEST program, which stands for Refugee Entrant Vocational Education Services and Training Program. 
The program is located at uh, Miami Dade College. We have been in existence since 1999, and we have served more than 30,000 students since then. And that is 30,000 people that have gone through our classrooms, have learned something, either uh, language to the communication level or very good uh, language skills, and then they move on into vocational training, and they have been getting certificates in uh, from nursing to business, computer programming, etc. Um, are, are any of you familiar with the REVEST program? I know that some of our students are even teaching now in, in the Day County Public School system. But definitely you are familiar with uh, some kids, some re recently arrivals, some uh, kids that you have in your classrooms that are basically refugee kids. Uh, we, are, we are training their parents here in the process. But I wanted to point out some uh, interesting detail. Um, and as you may know better than I, uh, many of these kids, their learning curve is faster and they are they are learning the language much much faster than their parents and then they are struggling with the fact that for example they have to do homework and when they get home their parents cannot help them because basically they don't speak the language so the, it ends up that uh, the kids are basically teaching their parents more English than we do in the program <laughs> itself so um, I wanted to point out that you have a big responsibility in your hands whenever you're dealing with one of those kids. Uh, the refugee resettlement process is a very painful process. Uh, as you saw also in the video, we try to keep it a little more lighter, but there's always that ray of sadness behind the resettlement process. A refugee is somebody that basically escapes or leaves their country of origin uh, out of fear of prosecution, even death or, or, or physical uh, punishment. So these people go through a very difficult process before they travel to the, to the accepting country, in this case the United States, during the travel, which is also a very traumatic process, and then once they arrive and they start to try the resettlement process, when they try to learn the language and when they try to leave, get a job, drive around. Uh, we're dealing with a population that has many, many needs. So please keep that in mind when you're seeing those uh, kids in your, in your classrooms. Uh, they're struggling with a lot of these uh, traumatic experiences and they're also struggling to, to make it happen in, 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 the new, in the new country. And they're struggling with their parents who cannot understand uh, even the homework that they are trying to help them with. The program is funded by the State of Florida, Department of Children and Families. The Office of Refugee Services is part of the Department of Children and Families. And as I mentioned, there is a, a similar program in, the, in Miami-Dade County Public School System. The purpose is basically to provide adult education and language acquisition, visual and vocational training um, for, for them to resettle effectively, for them to enter the workforce as, as soon as possible. And all services are free, but they are contingent upon the clients being employed or engaged into some kind of job seeking opportunities with the job service providers. They have to be either working or trying to get a job and, uh, and in that process. The eligibility criteria, who, who do we work with? We're, we're working with Cuban Haitian refugees and, and entrants. I already mentioned the definition of refugee by standards of the United Nations. Asylum applicants, people that are in the process of uh, adjusting to a political asylum process. Asylees of all nationalities, Amerasians, that uh, Amerasians are kids or people, descendants from American soldiers from any country in Asia that had some kind of war conflict in the past, like for Vietnam, for example. Uh, and certified victims of trafficking. Are you familiar with the term victim of trafficking? All the other are, are uh, terms that are, we are 
pretty much familiar with them, but this, this victims of trafficking cases, it refers to what they call nowadays uh, modern slavery, is the, the nowadays slavery, is the people that are brought to this country with a promise that they are going to be given some paperwork and they will be able to work so that they can send money back to their families and then they, op they ended up being uh, slaved in, in, in prostitution cycles and uh, they keep their passports and, uh, and they threaten to kill the families uh, abroad if they don't basically prostitute themselves working for, for somebody. Um, that's like the second most uh, lucrative business in the criminal world after, after the, the drug cartels. Yep. How do they how do they not so much repatriate but find where these children belong? Obviously they're they're not able to explain themselves where they come from. Um, no, it's it's not it's not um, usually what, what's happening, even though there is a huge task force and there's a lot of uh, government organizations working on this on this problem. Uh, base, the majority of these kids are found after they have been in the streets for years, months, and so the, the, the trauma is already having an effect in them. These people have uh, uh, an automatic uh, asylum granted, and they have to start working on the on the healing process. So it's not that they uh, it's not basically uh, coyotes bringing illegal immigrants. This is a a, a huge operation, mafia involved, and uh, the way it usually happens is that they find, identify the victims after they have been in the streets, they have been in the, in the, in the field out there for many, many uh, days, months, or even years. So the trauma is, is uh, really uh, intensive. Um, even after they found them and identify them, there is a process of trying to get them to uh, denounce the people that brought them because remember that they have their families hostages in their native country as well. So it's a, it's a really difficult and painful process for the victims and for the families. Uh, they are, the numbers in Florida are increasing significantly day after day, so um, that's why I wanted you to bring special attention to that case in case you identify any sign of anybody that is related to somebody that is a victim of trafficking, please contact the local police and just mention, I think I have identified a victim of trafficking. And they will, they will basically uh, take care of the situation. But it's, it's, it's a really complicated problem. So those are the, the clients that we are dealing with. Those are the people that we are receiving and we are helping in the process of, of resettlement. And as, as you saw, they bring a lot of human capital with them. So basically the community will also benefit eventually from the training and the recertification process of these uh, professionals, in, in, in many occasions, professionals. What we offer at the REVEST program is uh, four levels of intensive uh, VESOL, 16 weeks of instruction in, in each level, uh, one week of employability skills where we teach them how to conduct job interviews and how to uh, behave professionally once they get their, their jobs. GED classes for those that are not, that, that didn't finish, didn't get to finish high school in their countries or on, and are older uh, than 18 years old. And citizenship preparation classes for those that are, have already been long enough in the country so that they can present to the naturalization uh, process. We have convenience schedules in the morning, in the evening, weekends. We have even considered teaching on Sundays. We try to adjust to their needs because these people, they have to be working, as I mentioned before. They, they are working either part-time or full-time, so they, we have to try to adjust to their, to their schedules and, and their needs. <clears throat> We also offered uh, many vocational programs. 
um, that they will get a certificate that will help them also in the in the in the resettlement process to get a better job and uh, better paid. These are some of the most popular programs that go from accounting operations, administrative assistance, to these in the medical field, uh, massage therapy, medical assistant, pharmacy technician, practical nursing. There's, it's a very popular program, especially in the in the Haitian population. Uh, and it's interesting that many of these uh, Haitian students that are going into nursing, they have expressed that they want to go back to Haiti and do some of the work there uh, as well. So again, it's, it's the idea of completing the cycle. We also help them as, as they come with a human capital, they come with the knowledge. They are professionals already, but we help them in the translation and the recertification process of their titles or their degrees from their native countries. So we reimburse 100% of the cost for them to translate and do that, that process. We provide them with transportation assistance, we give them a metro pass so that they can travel to work, to school, and everything is contingent upon attendance to school. So we always try to keep them in the process of learning, getting to school, and getting to work, and uh, resettling as, as conveniently as possible. Child care service referrals, many, many times students start missing schools because they don't have anybody to take care of their children, especially now in the summer, for example, when there's no school. So we have to refer them to child care services so that they can continue uh, that process as well. And employment referrals, if any of the students is uh, unemployed, we refer them to an employment agency or if they were employed before, but they lost or changed uh, something in uh, a work, we refer them back to employment uh, agencies. As I mentioned, all services are free for eligible students, but continuing upon employment and, and job seeking efforts. These are our locations. We are, the headquarters is located at the Wolfson campus in, in Miami Dade College. And we have our reach centers that are outside of the colleges. We try to keep uh, a, a specific refugee population that helps them in the process of assimilating and learning uh, in a more uh, convenient atmosphere. They, they feel more identified with their people. The vocational training, though, it happens in, in the regular mainframe college students. So these people are basically competing or sharing the room with regular mainframe students. So that puts another uh, pressure on them to develop the language skills needed and, and progress in those courses. We have a center in Hialeah, we have another one in the West Dade area, and one in, in Kendall. This is the Wolfson campus. We started there with 130 students back in 1999. Now the average enrollment is 900 students uh, per semester. This is the West State Center, and it's, it's an interesting picture. The, the students that you see there are aligned. It's a line that once we put out the, the testing session dates, students will, will actually come in mass, and, and we've seen lines of 500 people trying to register uh, to the program. Um, so definitely there is a need out there for this type of services. We started with 221 students. Today, the average enrollment is 1,000 per semester. And the center in Kendall, we, we opened uh, recently in, in 2008. Started with only 13 students at that point, and now we have an average of 800 uh, students. Those centers are where we teach uh, VSOL only. Again, the vocational training happens in the Miami Day College. Uh, regular vocational training uh, classes. So how is REBIS funded? It is, as I mentioned in the first slide, uh, it's funded by the Department of Children and Families, the Office of Refugee Services. And the money comes from Health and Human Services. It's a federal grant that comes to the state to fund the resettlement of, of refugees. It's a national program, federal money, channeled through the DCF 
at the state level. Do you have any plans of expanding? We always do. We always do, but budget is very limited. Budget is very limited. And uh, even though Florida is the state where most uh, refugees and asylees resettle too, even there is what is called a secondary migration. Some of these people may arrive to the United States, they go to another state, but eventually they will come back to Miami because of their Haitian relatives here or Cuban, hey, Cuban uh, relatives. So there, Florida is the state that receives the most refugees. However, as I mentioned, this is a national program and we always have to be competing with other states that in some cases it all depends on, on the lobbying efforts of the states. For example, in, it, it has been a trend for a few years uh, back that Florida receives approximately 27,000 refugees per year. States like Iowa or, or uh, some northern states, they may be dealing with a uh, population in the hundreds, but they still compete at the same level for funding so that we can provide the same opportunities for everybody. But then again, sometimes it all depends on the lobbying efforts that the state puts into securing that funding. 27,000 refugees a year, it's a lot of people for, the, for Florida. What has been the impact of the anti-immigrant attitude in the country? Just like I was saying, the funding is always being reduced. On the students? Well, this is my favorite subject now and, and this year. This is my new quest. Miami, contrary to, to uh, popular belief, Miami is a, it may be a very benevolent, very easy community for refugees to resettle, especially Haitian, Cubans, Colombians, Venezuelans, because everybody here somehow, as we saw at the beginning of the presentations, everybody here somehow is related to a refugee or is related to an immigrant or has some kind of immigration in their past. So Miami appears to be a very easy community to resettle into. People can survive here speaking Spanish or people can survive in their community in Creole in, in the Little Haiti area. So. My point is that it isn't. That because of that facility that, that, that we see in Miami that people can resettle easily, I think this population is swallowing and is a lot of those traumas that I mentioned pre and post travel are sinking. And uh, I, I have cases of students that don't even talk about um, their immigration process because everybody has a, a worse story. And, and again, I, I, I'm trying not to make it too dark, but we're dealing with populations that have dealt with deaths in their families in the process of, of uh, immigrating to the United States, even though it is on a legal, regular, uh, regulated basis as refugees. It's very difficult. We, we've had students that have had to let go their significant other or family or child gone in the raft because they drowned. Or somebody that was killed in Colombia by the guerrillas or the army, they don't even know who killed them, but they killed them, their neighbors or their friends. So this population with all of that traumatic experience is coming to Miami and basically resettling because it's easy here. You can speak the language and you can survive. But uh, I mentioned it is my quest because I'm trying to secure funding to pay a little more attention to the mental health problem that we see in the community. We are dealing with a population that 10, 20 years from now may erupt with a lot of uh, traumatic disorders that may come afloat after they have been uh, you know, silenced for so many years. So the anti-immigrant uh, uh, feeling in the, in the country obviously will have a more negative effect on that process as well. I, I don't even want to talk about my immigration process if the whole country has this kind of anti-immigrant feeling. So I think that's, that's the effect. And that's why, again, I, I'm trying to 
secure more funding and try to secure better ways, establish the network with the mental health service providers so that we can pay more attention to this population that quietly is resettling, but painfully swallowing those experiences. So I don't know if that uh, more or less summarizes the question. It's, it, it has a cost and effect. I think the only accommodation they get is they get they go to a visual uh, class, and uh, not even in some cases when the schools don't have that that program they don't even so they have to struggle at the same pace of regular students trying to get the language. So it's great that you ask that question. If you feel the need for this, please bring it back to your administrators because there's a lot more that we can do as a community other than just receiving 27,000 refugees a year, helping them to resettle. Yes, kids can go immediately to school, but there's a lot. There's way more behind that process. So thank you for that question. No, no. Uh, funding is always limited and reducing. The Office of Refugee Services every year gets less funding. Less funding. So, for example, the child care referrals, we have to count on, on Day County uh, child care services. So we have to refer them there. We don't, we don't have any funding. Miami Dade, Miami Dade County. The county controls that child care services. We, refugee services doesn't have any control of that. So if they don't offer, like they don't, they don't offer child care services at night. I think for parents working all day in their hearts, they want to do this program, but sometimes they can't. Exactly. Well, for that reason, we have so many offerings as possible, and then we have the flexibility that we allow students to switch schedules. If they found a, a job and they were studying at night, now they want to come in the mornings. We basically keep them on the same level. We, we have a very um, academically oriented uh, curriculum. We deal with uh, managed enrollment uh, versus open enrollment. I don't know if you're familiar with the system. The, the program that I mentioned in the Dade County Public Schools struggles with that open enrollment because they have to be available for anybody arriving and immediately starting. But I think from the academic perspective, that open enrollment has a negative effect versus a, a controlled, managed enrollment that we have a first day of class, 15 weeks of instruction, a final exam, and then you go to the next level. So that's why we try to accommodate for work reasons, for childcare reasons, we try to keep them within that curriculum so that they don't waste uh, time. It's, it's a very intensive period. But childcare is one of the problems that we have. We don't have funding for it. We depend on the county. The county is also fun losing funds on that as well. So yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. Please bring it back to your principal, see if there's anything that they can do. They have a lot of power. They have a lot of power to work with, with us. They can contact the Office of Refugee Services. One of the great things that they, dis, that they did a couple of years ago is they relocated the Office of Refugee Services from Tallahassee to Miami, where everybody resettles in. So it's uh, at least that's something that we want, that they can see the needs and the problems that we have, like those with child care. Uh, if there's anybody that has an idea or want to talk about this in depth, um, again, I, there are some flyers out there. You can call any of the numbers. I'm located in downtown, so if you call the office in downtown, they can 
get me and I will very gladly work with any idea to, to help and fix problems like that one, yes. And this is the center in Hialeah. We opened in 2001 with 46 students only. Now we have approximately, approximately 1,200 students in that, uh, in that building for a total of approximately 3,500 students per semester in VESOL only, approximately 300 to 500 in vocational. We're dealing with 120 part-time instructors. It's a, it's a very large uh, program based on the actual need of services. And these are some of the demographics. Um, as I mentioned, more than 30,000 people we have helped uh, since 1999. And uh, in some, some cases that you're dealing with the kids of this uh, refugee population, what I always remark and I always tell our instructors and our staff is the responsibility that we have in our, in our hands because basically we are training, we are re-educating the population that in the future will vote for this community. So keep that in mind when you are also dealing with this kid that comes to your class that doesn't really know the system, that's the citizen of the future that basically will have also an effect in our community. So we have to be very careful on, 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 on the spectrum of all the education that they need that doesn't only imply language or a little vocational training for them to work. We're dealing with everything, ATM machine, transportation system, language, tax, democracy, all that. So it's, it's way more than, than just language and vocational training. The demographics are basically, the majority is uh, Cubans, followed by uh, Haitians and Colombians. And as the situation gets worse and worse in Venezuela, we're seeing more Venezuelans uh, coming, coming aboard. And this is the staff, as I mentioned. We have like almost 70 staff members and from between 90 and 120 instructors. Then, this is the, that was the way in. That's the people that we receive with all the human capital and the social capital that we mentioned before. And this is what Miami-Dade College is doing then in return to actually and, and, and factually complete the cycle. This is the, the, the remittance efforts that Miami-Dade is, is doing. We're transferring the ESL curriculum and methods of delivery to the Politecnico Internacional of Bogota in Colombia. Uh, Miami-Dade College math and science faculty are tutoring Haitian elementary school students in, in Port-au-Prince, in, in Haiti. And uh, they are training uh, in educational technology uh, many rural teachers in, in Haiti as well in partnership with uh, World Vision. Even students in, in more ecologically related programs are uh, collaborating on the developing of uh, development of tilapia ponds in, in Haiti, in rural Haiti. And there are some health missions of students and faculty in the nursing and physician assistant programs in the Dominican Republic. So we see examples here of the social remittance that Miami-Dade is leading the efforts to transfer that knowledge back to those countries where we're basically receiving refugees from in Colombia, in the case in Haiti, and then well in, in Dominican Republic. So uh, opportunity changes everything somehow. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you so much. The information is out there in the flyers. Please feel free to give us a call. Thank you.